I think without exception, in each of these counties, I heard the exact same thing. Nobody listened to us. Nobody talked to us. They opened up an office someplace, started handing out literature a couple months before the election, and they packed up the place a month after the election and disappeared. Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV, and today we're talking with Ed Morrissey. He is the Grand Poobah at Hot Air, the very popular and wonderful blog. I know I read it almost every day. And he's the author most recently of Going Red, the two million voters who will elect the next president and how conservatives can win them. Ed, thanks for talking to us. It's great talking with you, Nick. So you write in the book that in 2012, the Republican Party did an autopsy. of Why did they lose in 2012? And in fact, since George H.W. Bush won in 1988, there's only, the only time that Republicans have won a majority of the popular vote was in 2004. That's correct, okay. yes. So you write, GOP, the G uh, Republican Party has nationalized their election strategy while Democrats have gone hyper-local and the results speak for themselves. What do you mean by that? In 2008, uh, Barack Obama managed to outfight Hillary Clinton for the nomination in large part because of his ability to organize effectively on the ground and to connect emotionally with voters, not just by saying, hi, I'm Barack Obama, I'm a great guy, I'm cool, I'm hip, but by talking pe to people in these communities and asking, what is it that, what are your concerns? What's the issues in your community? And then they would find people to, to convert into ambassadors into each of these neighborhoods and say, you know what, you know this issue that we've been talking about? Well, Barack Obama's plan has, addresses that, and this is the way it does that. And they were, you know, they were doing the pizza parties, they were doing all these, you know, normal Which, block and, and tackle. And I, I know I, at various points, I, su I suspect that you might have, like a lot of the times, you'd, you'd see these efforts and you'd be like, this is so stupid, this is It'd be ridiculous. Silly. It's, it's but nonsense. But that localization, it's kind of like, it's personalization, it's individualization of politics that we've seen in almost every other aspect of our lives. Right, and this is something that both Republicans and Democrats do uh, outside of presidential elections. Republicans, over the same period of time that we're talking about, 2008, 2012, Republicans have garnered more state legislative seats since Herbert Hoover. They have won more governorships than they've had in quite a long while. I think 31 or 32 governorships in that uh, period of time. And even in these same states that they lost to Barack Obama in 2008 and 2012, most of them had Republican legislatures and Republican governors. So the Republicans in these local communities understand how to connect to local voters. But the presidential election, presidential campaigns never actually did. So, I mean, part of, you know, the point of the book, and again, which just has a massive amount of reporting, which I think is fascinating in the way that you work through all of these, the main point is that you have to go local in order yes. to win national elections. So in these counties all over the country in different kinds of economic situations, political situations, what, you know, is there a, I, I mean, you need to be attentive to what that area wants or needs, but what is the general message then? They have to start listening to people. And I'll, I'll tell you what that provides. First off, it allows them to understand what the priorities are in, in these different counties. And so they can, they can uh, readjust their own priorities so they're addressing these, these issues. But the second thing is, is it provides a feedback loop to see whether or not the message is working. You know, if all you're doing is running national messaging, you're running it in every single state, and you're not listening to people on the ground, you, you have no feedback loop. And that's the reason why a lot of us sat around shocked on election night 2012, which is how the book opens right. up, which is, you know, this egg on all of our faces, about the outcome of this election. Had, they, had we been listening to them, people that were in these communities, we would have known where this election was going, and we would have known it early enough to perhaps make some adjustments in approach. So you're missing that feedback loop, which is a key thing. But also, politics should be peer-to-peer. -peer. It should not be a top-down lecture. You look at seven counties that are in toss-up areas, and basically your argument is that whoever wins these counties is going to win the national election. Let's talk about Hamilton, Ohio. Because yes. Hamilton, Ohio, it's where Robert Taft, Mr. Conservative, was from. It has a long lineage. as uh, what, what did you find there that Republicans or conservatives need to do in order to win a county that they should be walking away with? Well, first off, they're going to have to recognize that the county has changed quite a bit, dramatically, in fact. Over the last 46 years, Hamilton County's lost about 12% of its population. Now, that is very different than the other counties that we're looking at, where either the population has remained stable, although the demographics have changed, or there's been tremendous growth. For instance, Wake County, North Carolina, there's been a lot of growth. It was the fastest growing county in the first decade of the 21st century in the United States. 
But Hamilton County's had a net loss, and a fairly significant one. Cincinnati is even worse. They've lost 40% of their population over the last 50 years. And there's very clear reasons why that happened. The manufacturing base collapsed. The economy collapsed. Those who were Let's face it, the Cincinnati Bengals collapsed. The Cincinnati with Bengals collapsed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I know I'm a Pittsburgh Steelers fan, so maybe I shouldn't say this. But in Cincinnati, 40% of the population fled. It was the, for the most part, it was the 40% who were economically mobile enough to be able to do that. So you had Republicans that were going out to the to the collar counties around Hamilton, Butler being uh, especially one of those, uh, and even. Uh, for those who weren't Republicans, they were moving into those first-ring suburbs that Republicans used to be um, dominant in. So those first-ring suburbs are really what lost uh, Republicans the election in 2008 and, and again in 2012. Because nobody recognized that this is a much different place. Hamilton's a much different place and with different people who are still open to their message if somebody will show up and actually contextualize it for their lives. Well, and this goes to uh, some of the stuff that was in the Republican autopsy. If the yes. Republican Party is aging, uh, it's, it's shrinking in terms of self-identification. Gallup has, says about 26% of Americans identify, whether they register as a Republican or not, about 26% of Republicans, that's near a historic low. Democrats are also sloping down. But do Republicans have a message, say, in Hamilton County, Ohio, where they can go to uh, to blacks, to Hispanics, to women, uh, you know, uh, kind of constituencies that they haven't been doing well at with, but are set, you know, they said after 2012, those are the people we got to reach. Like, what would be the message in Hamilton County that would allow Republicans to connect with those people? Well, from the people I talked to, I talked to I talked to an Afri African American conservatives in in uh, Hamilton County. I talked to a few different people out in Hamilton County. Sure, but you have to understand what it is those those local concerns are and then say, well, look, this is what the conservative agenda, how the conservative agenda can address that. For instance, uh, one person, his father was uh, the inventor of the halogen light bulb that uh, is in, uh, that every, form of which yeah. is in every car now. And he was very proud about this. And I said, I gotta get this into the book because he was, he was very proud about this, but he was making a point about education because the education uh, system in Cincinnati has really struggled since then. and. Republicans can talk about school choice. They can talk about uh, bringing the control of schools back closer to the local level. I mean, there are points in the Republican agenda that really do speak to this, but you have to go in there and find out, well, we've got this failing school over here, but you know, there's, there's a private school that's just right down the road. It's accessible. All we need to do is free people up from being locked in these, uh, uh, these public school systems, especially the failing ones, so that parents can make a choice for a better education for their, for their kids. And that is a message that will resonate. In Wake County, North Carolina, you talk yes. to an activist, a young activist named Christian Grevy, and this gets to uh, you know, what libertarians care about. He said, you know, part of the problem with the GOP is that he said, quote, it's openly hostile to libertarians. Um, what, you know, and I got to agree, I mean, on a certain level, you know, when the libertarians show up, you, you know, people make a couple of pot jokes, uh, something about transgenderism, and then it's kind of, you know, and they t try and take you for granted, and that's not happening anymore. What, why should libertarians want conservatives to win the 2016 election? It's a great question, and, and look, I mean, you and I have been talking about this for a long right. time. Uh, first off, I think that the Republican slash conservative agenda is oriented towards limited government in a general sense. And I think that there are some areas of difference mm -hmm. in the conservative and libertarian uh, agendas. But generally speaking, we're, we're sort of marching in that same direction. Limited government, smaller government, uh, federalism, subsidiarity, you know, local control. So I think on a, on a broad level, that's true. But you're never going to make that sale unless you're reaching out to Christian Grevy and Sarah Remini, who's also in that chapter, and to the people in Jefferson County who say, you know, we show up and uh, the ratio of gray heads to non-gray heads is like nine to one, and nobody lets us in. Nobody lets us in the club. We have to be addressing all these different groups, and I think libertarians fit very well within the Republican coalition. If we go to them and say, look, this is what we're about, this is, and we're going to disagree on this, but yeah. we're going to agree on more. Can I ask, I mean, you, you mentioned Jefferson County, that's in Colorado. Yes. Colorado has legalized recreational pot and seems to be doing a very good job of it. They have more tax, literally more tax revenue than they can spend. Uh, violent crime is down, DUIs are down, et cetera. Is that something that the Republican Party and conservatives 
can actually live with. I think Republicans and conservatives can at least come to libertarians and say, look, we believe in federalism. So if Colorado wants to do this and Colorado wants to have the benefits and the consequences of this, then Colour let Colorado do that and we will tolerate that and, and see and let it be the you know, the, yeah. the experiment, the laboratory of democracy, like, like we like to say about the state, about states' rights. You know, part of the, I think the resistance both among libertarians, but I think also when you said like center right, I, I think to a lot of Americans is that the Republicans talk one way. I mean, conservative yes. Republicans, they say, you know what, we're going to cut government, we're going to cut the size, scope, and spending of government, except you know, uh, last time that they had control of the government, George Bush increased spending over his time in office by about 50 percent in real dollars. He started a couple wars that were not only ultimately unpopular, but poorly prosecuted, and I'd argue poorly conceived. Uh, you know, we ended up bailing out the auto industry. We ended yes. up bailing out big banks. We ended up pushing for more drug prohibition. Many of these civil liberties were in a shambles. Many of these same policies were continued by Obama. And then the one, the things that Bush was actually kind of good on, which was something like immigration, now the Republican Party is openly hostile to immigrants. So is that, I mean, is there a way that Ted Cruz or Donald Trump, given the focus on immigration, the focus on control and authority, is there any way that they are going to convince, whether it's libertarians or the country at large, that they're in the center as opposed to way, way far on the edge? Well, I mean, I think part of this is when you go talk to people in these communities, you look at Prince William County, for instance, where there is a, a, a heavy uh, Latino uh, presence in Prince William County. I talked to uh, Tito Munoz, who was known as Tito the Builder in the 2008 election. Great guy. Uh, and, and he believes that Republicans can address the immigration issue without abandoning their principles, but by explaining it better and, and being more connected to those communities and saying, look, you know, we're, about, we're about legal immigration. Because immigration is a federal government issue. I mean, right. even, even limited government activists understand that control of the national borders is a federal government issue. But, uh, but Tito says, look, you, you just have to come and talk to us to understand what it is that we're saying about this. You also have to understand that not all Hispanics are Mexican. Right. Not all Hispanics are that caught up in the immigration issue. And even those who are of Mexican descent in places like Colorado and, and also New Mexico, for that matter, are sometimes fifth, sixth, seventh generation Americans who are more interested in the economy. Uh, what uh, Overwhelmingly. I mean, even, even yeah. Iowa voters listed immigration was like a distant fourth it, in it their is. concerns. So. It is. And so some perspective yeah. on that would be, would be a good way to do that. But the only way you're going to get that perspective is going out and talking to these voters right. and hearing what they have to say. Well, so in a way, I mean, you're a great uh, kind of self-made blogger and new media superstar. And essentially what you're saying is that, you know, politicians need to be doing what you're doing, which is actually being in touch with the community and building a community that, that speaks in two directions. That it's, I think you said it's not a lecture or a sermon. It's peer-to-peer. It's peer-to-peer. -peer. Peer -peer. And, and I'd even make it easier than that. They need to talk to the people in those communities who have been successful at that. Yeah. National, the, the, the last two presidential campaigns would bring in people from the outside to run campaigns in these swing states and these swing communities without listening to anybody else on the ground. And to, I think without exception, in each of these counties, I heard the exact same thing. Nobody listened to us. Mm -hmm. Nobody talked to us. They opened up an office someplace, started handing out literature a couple months before the election, and they packed up the place a month after the election and disappeared. And nobody was listening to us. Nobody talked to us about our own constituents, the people that we know, we could have told them this message isn't working, this is not going to work, you need to be focusing on this issue or that issue and here's how you can frame it and nobody listened to them. So I mean it's even easier than this. Just getting just get in contact with the people who are successful. That's that's the that's the way you do this. Uh, are you looking forward to a contested Republican nominee, uh, convention? Looking forward is probably not the exact way that I would put this, but I think it's very likely now that we're going to have a contested uh, convention. I'll be there, obviously, yeah. reporting on this, and so it will be interesting because it'll be the first time. If we go to a second ballot, it'll be the first time in, I believe, uh, 68 years that a Republican convention has gone to a contested ballot or, or a second ballot and. Um, for Democrats, it was 1952. For us, it was 1948. Wow. And uh, so, it'll be it'll be unique. Yes. Um, it'll be entertaining, I think, to a certain extent. And I think the question that you have to ask yourself coming out of a contested convention is: Were people satisfied by the process well enough to unite behind whoever the nominee happens to be? The good news on that is that there's three and a half months between the convention and the election, which is about double the time that they've had 
traditionally now for the last couple of decades. So there's plenty of time to sort of unite behind a nominee and get the divisions within the Republican coalition healed up to some extent so that you have some sort of party unity. But I don't know. It just well, depends and, on how it Well, you know, it may end up being a good lesson for the country, too. I mean, to yes. see. I mean, I'm, I, I wouldn't be surprised and I wouldn't shed many tears if the Republican Party seriously implodes. But the idea of a, of a contested election or watching a party reconstitute itself can be incredibly uh, uh, educational sure. and edifying, I mean, just to see the, the political process working well. It's still representative yeah. democracy. Right. I mean, we're electing delegates to go represent us at the, at the national convention, and we're relying on those delegates to reach a, a, a reasonable and rational conclusion. That's, that's still representative democracy. We've been talking with Ed Morrissey of Hot Air. He also writes for The Week and Fiscal Times. He's all over the place. And his latest book is Going Red, the two million voters who will elect the next president and how conservatives can win them. Ed, thanks so much. Thanks, Nick. For Reason TV, I'm Nick Gillespie.